We are at chapter 21. <laughs> well, not yet we didn't. <laughs> we, we have to get through a whole chapter in one class. <laughs> but there have been moments through this that I never thought we'd get here, did you? <laughs> so, all right, well, as I said, we're in chapter 21. Um, and when, whenever you start talking about John chapter 21, the first question that's going to come up is, is whether this chapter is, was original. Is it authentic? Does it have the same author? Um, and the reason that people ask those kind of questions is because the book could easily end at the, at the end of chapter 20. It's kind of like uh, the author makes a, uh, a, a final statement uh, to end and to conclude chapter 20. And in addition, the, the book has arrived at its conclusion. It has just told you the, the story of the disciples and then Thomas all coming to faith because of what happened on that Resurrection Sunday. And the, the author tells us very clearly that that was what his goal was, was to create uh, or to provide the evidence that we need to come to belief. So the first question that always comes up here is, was this authentic? There's several different ways you can look at that question. Part of the question will boil down to, okay, does chapter 21 contain the same kind of language that the rest of the book has? Or is it different? You know, I think if, if I wrote out a class for you and handed it to you, and if Lamar wrote out a class for you and handed it to you, you would easily be able to tell which was which because we're just, we, we express ourselves differently. And authors do the same thing. And so one of the questions is, is the language consistent or is it different? And if, you, if the experts tell us that if you take a look at chapter 21, most of it is reflective of the same kind of language that has been used in chapters 1 through 20. There are a few unique um, uh, expressions that are used in chapter 21, but by and large, it seems to be similar at least. So you can't really draw any conclusion from the language of, of chapter 21. What about the manuscripts and the texts? In other words, the question here is, have we ever seen any copies of John that didn't have chapter 21 in them? Okay, we talked previously about how Mark 16 there's a, there's a big section at the end of Mark that's questionable because the oldest manuscripts don't contain it. Does John have a similar finding? And the answer to that question is no. We cannot find any evidence that there was ever a text of the book of John that did not include chapter 21. All right, so textual evidence would be in support of this being the same document. And then the third thing that you would take a look at is well, does the content of John 21 fit in with the rest of the book? And is, is there a reason for it to be there? You know, and, and, and we see that in this case, the content of chapter 21 actually expands the scope of John's gospel. And it provides what I would call a bridge. It provides a bridge from the ministry of Jesus into the ministry that would follow, the ministry of the apostles, the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we see primarily in the book of Acts. But John 21 provides a bridge to connect those two things, which is an important uh, reason for it to be in existence. And so my personal conclusion on this is that it probably was the same author it has the same literary style. It has the same, there's some nuances we're going to talk about in a minute that uh, fit in here. It's possible that the author may have not originally written it out, but come back to it and added it later. That's certainly a possibility. We can't, we can't designate that one way or the other. Um, but that doesn't really matter. The important thing here is to see as we enter into chapter 21, that there is still some unfinished business that needs to be addressed. And this gets addressed now in chapter 21. So let's talk about what that unfinished business that chapter 21 addresses. What is that unfinished business that we're going to learn? Well, first of all, <clears throat> chapter 21 
completes what I have called this final cycle of Jesus' ministry. And this goes all the way back to one of our first classes when we were talking about how the book is put together. And if you recall, I told you that the book's put together in a group of cycles that sort of move us on down the road. And each section begins in Galilee and then goes to Judea where there's conflict. Usually Jesus is going there for a feast day and then it returns to Galilee again. And we saw that through the first part of the book where there was a lot of movement going on. But once we get to about chapter 10 or so, the movement stops because we're at that point, we're headed to Jerusalem for Jesus' final week. Um, and, and so that's the point where it seems like this cycling stops. But chapter 21 takes us from what has just happened now over these last several weeks in Jerusalem and gets us back up to Galilee to complete that final cycle. And so chapter 21 sort of takes us back to the beginning. It's, it's, there's this wonderful symmetry about, about the book and, and where, it, uh, where it concludes. Everything in chapter 21 starts out almost the same as it was in the beginning. Jesus is revealing himself to these men who have become his disciples, and they're out fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Now that's, that should bring back memories, because that was where that was all happening uh, in the past. But everything is different now, too. It's very similar, but everything's different because Jesus has completed this wonderful ministry and his purpose of coming and sacrificing himself for and to be the light of the world and to sacrifice himself for the sin of the world. Now they have seen that totally completed and they have a notion now of who Jesus really is and what his purpose was and why he came and completed that cycle in Jerusalem. And so this is this is part of, I mentioned a few minutes ago, that the author has some nuances that he follows through with. Well, this is one of those. He completes this final cycle, okay? And we end up back up in, in uh, Galilee. Secondly, this is John's version of a fishing story. Now, all the other Gospels have already given us a fish story, okay? But they're, they're similar, but they're different. And... Jesus had talked in the synoptics, he had talked to those men who were becoming his disciples, and he said, I'm going to transform you from fishers for fish into people who will fish for men. Okay, and that's the transformation that he talked to these fishermen about. But those events back then are different than what we see in chapter 21 here. Yes, they're both fishing stories, but... Those events were happening early in the course of Jesus' ministry. And he tells the fish story in that case as the disciples are becoming fishers of men, and they're going to become fishers of men, and they're simply being recruited to become those people at that, at that point in time in the Synoptic Gospels. But now in this Gospel, everything has sort of been completed, and now these same men are ready to go out in the world and actually put the nets in the water and go to work and, go to, and start fishing for people. And so they come at a different point in the ministry. And what's also important is that as we read through this, you'll see that John includes details so that we don't mix the two up. And the one I'm going to highlight is the fact that here he specifically says the nets don't break. But in the other story... The nets were all breaking because of the load of fish that they got. But John takes pains here to say the nets didn't break in this case. They, they couldn't get the, the, the load in the boat, so they had to tow it behind the boat, but the nets didn't break. So that's a whole, it's, and John is just reinforcing that this is indeed a second story, and he hasn't, or this is a second event, and so he hasn't just hijacked that original story to suit his purpose. This is a different event, okay? But the point of those stories is the same. The point of the story in the synoptics was that these disciples would become fishers of men. The point here in John is that these disciples are about to become fishers of men. And their fish will be of a different species. Okay. Um, 
third piece of unfinished business that's addressed in chapter 21 is Peter's role and Peter's position here. He had been groomed, there's no question that he was being groomed for a special role in God's kingdom, in Jesus' kingdom. But just recently now, he has failed Jesus miserably. Jesus had already met with Peter on that Resurrection Sunday. We don't know the content of that conversation, but we know it happened from Luke 24 and also from 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul and Jesus had already talked about this, and my guess is that they'd squared some of this business up already. But what had happened during Jesus' trial was not something that was solely between, G between Peter and Jesus. This was something that was public. And so Peter's standing within the group of disciples was also at risk, and it was uncertain. Where does he stand now after his behavior back then? Well, what had been so bad about Peter's behavior? After all, when we meet him at that, in, the, in the trial setting, when he, he goes ahead and denies Jesus, he's one of only two guys that are still there. Everybody else has already left. So sometimes we're so quick to criticize Peter for his failure, but on the other hand, what about the courage that it took for him to be there at that moment and in that position? That counts, right? But what Peter had done in addition to just simply denying Jesus was he had boasted about it ahead of time. In John 13, he had told Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. And then in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, Peter had said, even if everyone else falls away because of you, I will not. And he was grossly overconfident of his own standing and his own security with Jesus. And so his, his fall was profound and his fall was public. And now he's uncertain within the group. What does the group think of this situation? His, his restoration, you've heard the phrase perhaps that one's, one's um, restoration has to be as public as the sin that got you there. And that's, that's true in this case, that Peter's restoration had to be as public as what had got him in that situation. And then the other piece of unfinished business that we see addressed here are the future responsibilities that Peter will take on and that John will take on, okay, as the authors. We have to pay careful instruction, careful attention to the instructions that Jesus gave to both of these men because he takes a look into their future and he knows the service that they will ultimately provide for him. But he gives us that, that window of insight here in chapter 21. So those are some of the things that we're going to see. Let's first take a look at John's fishing story. And this is, uh, this is verses 21, excuse me, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. And Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? And they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's this wonderful symmetry about this event because the setting that this, this occurs in reminds us of those earlier times. And Jesus has now returned with his men to the place that, the, that, they, that it all started for them. But in the meantime, they have been completely transformed. They've been completely changed. The entire group was not there. We know that there, were, there are five individuals who are named, with James and John being the sons of Zebedee, and there are two that are left anonymous. According to verse 3, it's Peter's decision first to go fishing, and we can't say why he decided to go. There are some who have held out that, well, Peter was just ready to quit, and he's going back to start a fishing career again. But there's no evidence to support that. We, we just can't say with, with any degree of certainty why they decided to go fishing. Was it just recreational? Was it passing time? Were they waiting for Jesus to make the next move? Nobody knows. So don't try to attribute any, any motive to Peter uh, being there. And at, in verse 4, after an unsuccessful night of fishing, Jesus stands on the shore, but they are unable to recognize him. And it's interesting, this phrase, when it says the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus, this is exactly the same phrase that was used back in chapter 20 and verse 16 when Mary Magdalene thought she was seeing the gardener. And, and, and she said, oh, I'm sorry, I said it's verse 16, it's verse 14. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Exactly the same words. So that's what... That's what some have come to believe, that perhaps there was something that was altering their vision. We don't know for sure why, why they couldn't recognize that it was Jesus. But also remember, I told you last week, back the two men from Emmaus, they were, uh, they were unable to recognize Jesus until he was revealed during their meal together. So there are, there are several instances of this where they, they're unable to recognize Jesus. Craig? Sure. But they don't hear. No, they don't hear. Well, they don't. The voice doesn't get them either here. Well, read it carefully. We'll come to it in a second. <laughs> it's not the voice that they recognize. Um, okay, in verse 5, when Jesus asks them the question about their night fishing, he says, friends, haven't you any fish? That indicates that Jesus knew they hadn't caught anything because of the way he asked the question. Otherwise, he would say, did you catch anything? You know, that's the way you would normally ask the question. Jesus didn't ask it that way. He already knew that they hadn't caught anything. And the form of the question tells us that. So there's our first miracle, is that he already knows what, what, what has happened all night long and how unsuccessful that they have been. In verse 6, suddenly now their net is filled to the point of being un unable to retrieve it. And in verse 7, the recognition begins to dawn. And once again, it's this beloved disciple who seems to get it first. But who acts first? Who always acts first? Peter. Peter's out of the boat, he's in the water, and he's on his way to shore. <laughs> okay? And what was it that convinced them? It wasn't the question. It was when the net was full. What caused them to recognize Jesus in this situation was what he did, was what the miracle that he um, performed at that moment. So it was, what, it was what he had done for them. And what a comfort it is for them to look back on the time they spent with Jesus and to realize that he is in control of every situation. We talked about that. We started talking about that all the way back in chapter 2 when we talked about the wedding feast at Cana and how he was able to just take a situation and put out the fire. And what a great comfort that is for us 
and should be for us to know that he is in control of every situation. Verses 8 through 10, the others are left to tow the net behind the boat. And when they finally get to shore, Jesus has a fire going with fish and bread already going. But he tells them to bring some fish too. And this is where I want you to think about the fish story. Because what's going on here in the beach is what they're going to be doing with their career from this day forward. They are going to be fishing for men. And they're going to be bringing in men in the net for harvest. And that is, that is what their, their goal will be for the rest of their careers. Jerry? <laughs> yeah, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't know where he got the food. We don't know where they got the tribute money from. Remember from the fish they pulled the tribute money out of, out of the fish's mouth, you know? He, he, he wasn't dependent on normal things like the rest of us, was he? <laughs> In verse 11, the eyewitness author gives us this detail. He says there were 153 large fish. And there's been all kinds of speculation about what that 153 might or might not mean. And I'm going to show you a couple of these. They're going to drive you crazy, I know. But here's, here's the mathematical approach to what 153 might mean. Well, 153 is a, it, it's a mathematician's number because if you do something that's called a triangular sum and you build an equal, equilateral triangle with five units across the bottom, you're going to have five plus four plus three plus two plus one in it. And so that's the number of, I think that comes out to 15. So the triangular sum of five is 15. Well, if you keep working these numbers out, 153 is not a real common number, is it? But if you work these numbers out and you get to 17, you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, the triangular sum of 17 is 153. Okay? So people take that and they say, well, there's got to be something about 17 that makes this thing work, okay? Because that's the triangular sum will get us to 153. So, well, let's see. 17 is 10 plus 7. So it could mean the Ten Commandments. There's a 10. And then seven might mean the days of creation, or it might mean the sevenfold spirit of God, um, or seven might mean four plus three, in which case it means the Trinity and the New Jerusalem, which is a four-square city. So, you know, you can, you can just take these numbers and go crazy with them, and people have. <laughs> they, have, they, have they have gone nuts with this, and they've tried to turn John into Revelation. And they're not, it's not. So that's, that's one approach is the mathematical approach. But there's also another approach that was advocated by a guy way back in the 4th and 5th century. This was a fellow named Clement, and he took the biological or the natural approach. And as, as Jerome was a religious scholar, and as he studied this thing, he did some reading from a naturalist of the 2nd century, his name was Appian. He was a Greco-Roman philosopher and naturalist. And he had gone through and categorized and classified all the different species of fish that existed in the world. And according to Jerome, uh, Appian had come up with 153 different species of fish. And so if, if we're talking about 153 species of fish here, that means everybody's included, and that's symbolic of everybody in the world being eligible for the kingdom of God. All right, you see the parallel? But the problem, <laughs> the problem here is that if you go back and you look, and I haven't done this, I'm just trusting some others. If you go back and you look at Appian's writings, there's actually 157 different species. <laughs> so it's, it's just wrong. <laughs> so anyhow. Um, plus, you, you take a look, and, and many different naturalists have, of course, categorized the fish kingdom, and they've come up with different numbers as far as the numbers of different species of fish. So uh, that doesn't really work either. The reality, I think, here is that the 153 was just a lot of fish. And it means that even these guys who were fishermen recognized that this was such an important moment 
They caught so many fish that they needed to have a record of it. This was their Polaroid of the day. You know, they're, they're, let's count them. I can't believe we've got this number of fish. They had 153 fish. So it, it gives credibility to the author being that eyewitness who just simply wanted to verify the reality of what was going on. Okay, so back to the beach. The final thing that happens in this part of the event in verse 13 is that Jesus serves his men on the beach. Now, there have been a couple other times since Jesus' rec rec uh, resurrection that we have talked about him having something to eat or being recognized by others. And sometimes he would have something to eat, according to Luke chapter 24, he had something to eat, just to demonstrate that he had a somewhat human body and that he was still dependent upon uh, natural nutrition. Okay, and so he ate something there. And then also it seemed that when he uh, appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus, when they sat down for dinner, that he had something to eat. And that was the moment when their eyes were opened and they were enlightened and able to recognize Jesus. Okay, but neither of those factors are in play here. All right? Jesus, we don't even know that he ate. The text doesn't tell us that. <laughs> um, he invites them to come and eat, but he never, it never really says that Jesus ate anything. And then secondly, in addition to that, uh, where was I going with that? Um, this doesn't provide any sense of recognition. By this point in this event, they've already realized who Jesus is. So this is not providing any recognition. This time, when Jesus provides them with the meal, he's just simply meeting the needs of what his disciples need. They, they're tired. They're hungry. They've been out all night fishing. They've had a bit, they're probably muttering at one another. You know, this, is, this has not been, just not been their finest hour. And so Jesus is just simply there to provide them with that which they need. And again, he's meeting the needs of, of those that he loves. Paul? Yes. Did you find any significance with the first story said that that's the I did not. I did not. Sorry. Yep, I did not. Okay, uh, so let's turn next to the continuation of the text because now Jesus turns his attention to Peter. Verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself, went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is, it, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, well, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And Jesus begins now with this seemingly simple question for Peter. Do you truly love me more than these? Meaning, do you love me more than these other disciples as you have claimed in the past? He returns to those boasts that Peter had made on the night of Jesus' arrest, that he would never abandon him, even if everybody else did. And Jesus uses the Greek word agape here as he asks that question. And the Greek word agape is one that we say 
includes the entire will of a person, one's intention. Um, it's, a, it's a decision. It's, it's made with the mind, and it involves our entire personality being involved with that. Well, Peter, by this time, realizes that this is a loaded question. This isn't as simple as he thought back then. He has seen that his boasting can be really empty and leave him in a bad place. And so Peter's answer is tentative. And it's indicated by a shift in the word that he answers Jesus with. And he says, yes, Jesus, I phileo you. Or specifically, he says, you know that I phileo you. And this Greek word is a little bit different. This Greek word is a little more spontaneous affection for one another. It's a little more emotional, but it's an easier type of love with less commitment. The NIV, as you read it, will indicate that because the NIV, when, you, when, when the Greek word is agape, it will say truly love. And when the Greek word is phileo, it will just say love. Okay? But the other translations, at least I looked through about a dozen of them, and I couldn't see that they used any difference here between those two Greek words. Yeah. Well, each, each translation has its strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I, I, I don't intend to beat up the NIV. I read out of the NIV more often than anything else. But, you know, it's, any translation you use, you've got to be careful of it. There, there are strengths and weaknesses of anyone. Okay, then the whole round starts again. Jesus asks Simon, Simon, do you truly love me? Again, using the word agape. And Peter now answers, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Round three. Jesus now changes things up. And he shifts. And he, he matches Peter now. And he says, Peter, do you phileo me? And this is now when Peter is hurt. He's grieved by the question that Jesus has asked. He's upset about it. Peter sounds a little confused. He says, you know everything, Lord. You know, why are you searching me so hard here? Okay? And Peter ultimately answers again, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Now, most of us have, I think most of us are familiar with this difference in the words and have, have, have seen this before. The problem with this is we don't know how significant those language changes are, all right? And I'm going to, it's possible that they mean what we've just said and that, you know, uh, Jesus dumbs down his question the third time to meet where Peter's at. That's possible. But it doesn't have to mean that because, number one, the definitions of these two words, agape and phileo, are not as rigid as we have come to believe. All right? And if you take a look through the Gospel of John, you'll see surprises where the word agape is used and where the word phileo is used. And let me give you an example. I don't want you to look this up, but in John chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus says, the Father loves the Son. Now, one would think that would be agape, but it's not. It's phileo. And so it appears that John almost uses these words interchangeably. And so it may not be carrying that same meaning, okay, that, that we have given to it. Um, there's something else in play here also, and that is that Jesus is using word pairs all over the place in this conversation. One of the word pairs he's using is this agape and phileo, as he, as he asks Peter and he questions Peter about his love. But then he goes on to tell Peter to do something. And what he tells him to do is sometimes to feed or shepherd, and at other times is to take care of or to tend. So he uses two different verbs there also. And he also uses two different objects of that verb. Sometimes he calls those ones who are going to be tended and fed. Sometimes he calls them his sheep. And once he calls them his lambs. 
Again, different words. So Jesus is using these word pairs, and John captures that. Whether that means this about love, we don't know for sure. Or is John and Jesus just simply um, being poetic? Wordsmithing, as he uses these combinations of words to say the same thing. We don't know. But we do know that Peter was upset. And what we can know upset him for sure was that Jesus has just asked him this question the third time. And what does that bring up for Peter? The threefold denial. Absolutely. There's no way he could have escaped that. That had to be troubling for him. And the text says in, in the NIV, it says Peter was hurt. Other versions say Peter was grieved. He was, he was gut-wrenched over this. He was really upset about this thing. Okay? And it had to remind him of the three times that he had failed to, to stand up for Jesus after Jesus had predicted it and Peter had turned around and blown him off. <laughs> now let's take a look at the commandment that Jesus gave to Peter. G uh, there we go. Back to, back to Peter. This is, in, uh, this is again in verses 15 through 17. And the commandment that uh, Jesus gives to Peter is to feed or tend or shepherd his sheep and his lambs. And this needs to remind us of what Jesus had said all the way back in John chapter 10 when, he, when Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd. And now he's telling Peter, you are going to be an under-shepherd to take care of my people. And that's, what, that's the message that he is now giving to Peter. This is, the, this is the task that will comprise the rest of Peter's life. And indeed, he took it to heart. Because if you take a look at 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter writes these words about shepherding. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder, as a fellow shepherd, a witness of Christ's sufferings and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And here we go. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Peter took that message to heart to be one of those under shepherds. It's important for us to see that Jesus never told Peter to assume an office because many religious people have put Peter in a religious office. That's not what he was ever told to do. Peter was told to do the grunt work, to do the grunt work of serving, shepherding, feeding, and tending. Those are the things that Peter was told to do. And then in verses 18 and 19, Jesus looks into Peter's future. Um, Jesus foresees that Peter is going to lose his freedom. He says, someone is going to dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And he also foresaw how Peter would die because he said to Peter, someone's going to stretch out your hands. And by stretching out your hands in the first century context that was clearly understood, that was a death by crucifixion. But on the positive side, sometimes we read this and we think, Jesus had nothing good to say to Peter. He did. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, Peter is going to see long life. And he's going to see a long life of service for Jesus. And so he's going to be blessed by that. And so there's this positive side to what Jesus um, is going to, to what Peter is going to experience. In verses 19 through 22, we then have Jesus' final instruction to Peter. And his final instruction begins and ends with, it's like bookends, where Jesus says, follow me. On the, at the beginning of what he says and at the end of what he says. There can be no question that he wants Jesus um, 
paying, excuse me, that Jesus wants Peter to be paying attention to himself. Because in the past, what's gotten Peter in trouble is comparing himself to other people. And saying, oh, I'm better than they are. I'm going to do more than they are. I'm going, to, I'm going to serve you better than they will. No, Jesus says, focus on me. Follow me and take your eyes off of the others, including this one that's following us right now. Peter is to be laser focused on himself as he follows Jesus and as he shepherds Jesus' sheep. The interesting thing about this is by the time John writes these words, everything has been accomplished. Peter has lived that long life. Peter has served as the shepherd. Peter has written those words of 1 Peter chapter 5. And Peter has died. And Peter, as we, you know, historically the story is that Peter was crucified and that he was crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to be killed in the same way that Jesus himself was. Um, and so by this time, by the time of this writing, as, as the author points these, this prophecy out, everybody who's looking at it can see that this has already been fulfilled. It has already taken place. And then in verse 23, the author provides this point of clarification where he says, Jesus didn't really say that the disciple whom Jesus loved would live until Jesus came back again. Others have thought that he said that, but he didn't really say that. Now, why does he clear that up? Well, because he's still alive. And at some point, he, he's probably going to die in the near future. And if he does... And this rumor is floating amongst the believers all of a sudden, oh, something Jesus said didn't come true. We can't believe anything now. Okay, so that would have hindered their faith. So he wants to clear this up, and he includes this message before the time that it's necessary. And then we get to the last little piece here, which is the, the author's epilogue. Uh, he has one more piece left of unfinished business. And this is the, to reveal the identity of that unnamed disciple. Who was it that was there at the supper? Who was it that was at the tomb? Who was it that was here on the beach? Because this unnamed disciple whom Jesus loved has shown up time and again throughout the writing, but who was it? Well, let's listen to what the author says. He says, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. And if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And in verse 24, the author finally reveals that he is the one who's been going incognito through the book. He's been anonymously mentioned several times in the book. He's been described as either the disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved in, in, in several different occasions. And now he is verifying that this is indeed his testimony of his eyewitness and those things that he saw and those things that he experienced. Now, he doesn't identify himself at John, as John. We have to make that final step. And let me suggest to you three different reasons that I think, I believe strongly that this was John. First of all, there's a known association between Peter and John. We've had multiple episodes in this gospel and in the others where they are the, clearly the lead apostles. John appears to be the one who gets the insight first. Peter is the one who consistently takes action first, okay? And he steps out. He's the, he's the more courageous of, of, the, of the group, okay? And so those two seem to function as co-leaders amongst the group. That's one reason that I believe that, that this is John, because they're depicted as being together uh, at the Last Supper, at the tomb, here again. The two of them are isolated with one another quite frequently. Now, the second reason I believe this is John is because of the fact that his name wasn't used. And it's conspicuous by his absence. The author mentions a lot of names of the other apostles. He specifically mentions 
Peter, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, and Thomas. He mentions several of them in different situations. Now, from the other Gospels, we know that Peter, James, and John were a threesome that was in, Je it's often called Jesus' inner circle, okay? And the fact that he is never named in the Gospel, I don't know how you could tell the story without him being in it because he was there at all those important moments. And so the fact that he is not named makes him conspicuous, okay? And then the third thing is that the way this gospel ends and this rumor going on about the, the author having this long life, well, that's John. All the other apostles have died, right? And so it, that, that leaves it in my mind to be fairly convincing that this is indeed uh, John the Apostle who was first an eyewitness to these things, and then he also wrote them down and created this, this wonderful record. But why does John remain anonymous? Why does he not name himself? Well, we've talked before. Perhaps it had something to do with the political climate at, late in the first century. Um, it was a dangerous thing to be a Christian, maybe even more dangerous to be a Christian author. Um, I'm not sure that I... Think, I don't think that was the main reason. I think there are other more important reasons here for John not to name himself. And the primary one, I believe, is that he doesn't want to upstage Jesus. He does not want to take the focus off of Jesus. And for John to have named himself, he is the only one still alive. Guess what's going to happen as soon as something, some gospel comes out describing John's experiences with Jesus? Well, people are going to look at him a little differently. And, and, and pretty soon, the, the attention lens is going to fit, uh, shift from Jesus over to John because he's, he's the one, he's the tangible proof of all of this. John doesn't want that. And you can prove that by looking at how verses 24 and 25 are structured. Look at verse 24. John talks about himself. I am the disciple who saw these things, and my testimony, this testimony, is true. But where does he go then in verse 25? He goes back to Jesus. And he puts, shifts the lens forever back upon Jesus. And he says, everything that I saw, everything that I did, that was just a drop in the bucket compared to all the other things that Jesus did. You see, that's what he's saying in verse 25. What I've done doesn't matter. It's all about Jesus. And he's shifting that, that lens of attention, that lens of focus back to Jesus where it has to shine brightly. Well, that's John 21. Um, next week, next week we're going to try to summarize this. How? Don't ask me. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about this next lesson for months, uh, and, and how in the world we can possibly capture some of this but I'm going to do my best and uh, <laughs> if if you're able to be here be here next Sunday because I think I think it'll be a special uh, a special word of instruction and a special word of blessing for all of us so God is good all the time, all the time.